Thank you, everyone, for joining us for part two of Dr. Cynthia Kaur's webinar titled, What Early Interventionists Need to Know About Bilingual Language Development and Toddlers. If you previously missed the first webinar, uh, we will post that link in the chat box, which you can see there. Thank you, Jeannie. My name is Lisa Terry. I'm an early, interven early intervention professional development consultant, and Jeannie Schroeder, she's our e-learning specialist. She'll be in the background producing the webinar. So many thanks to Jeannie. So I want to go ahead and take a minute to introduce Dr. Cynthia Kaur. She is an associate professor of speech language pathology at the George Washington University. She has been an early intervention service provider in Arlington County for the past two years, and she previously worked with uh, providing speech services in child care centers for several years in Palm Beach County, Florida. So thank you, Cynthia, for your time and your passion to this topic, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. So hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Kaur. Um, and like Lisa said, I'm a professor of speech language pathology at the George Washington University, um, where I teach graduate students who are becoming speech language pathologists. Um, for about the past 10 years, I've been researching bilingual language development, mainly with Spanish and English speaking toddlers from about two and a half years to school entry. And now we're even following up on those children up to the end of third grade, so seeing how their early learning leads to their later academic outcomes. And so um, for the first part of my talk today, I'm going to review some of the key points on bilingual language development that we covered in the, the first part of this two-part series uh, last month. And this is directly from my research, but also from the research of um, other people who are looking at bilingual language development right now. So for today's talk, we're going to um, review what we already know about bilingual development, but then we're also going to talk about special populations, um, when we might expect bilingual children to catch up to monolinguals, and how we can help families who speak a language other than English or Spanish at home. So if you participated in part one of this talk, or if you watched the archive recording, could you raise your hand by going to the tool right underneath your name and just clicking the hand if you, um, if you participated? This is great. It looks like most of the people here today did participate, so that's great. So we're going to go through the, the key points that I focused on last time um, and just do a very quick review. And the first main point that I'd like to make is that bilingualism is not confusing. Children can learn two languages, but learning two languages takes longer than learning one language. And we like to joke in our research meetings that bilingual children are not awake twice as long as monolingual children. Uh, and so it takes them just a little bit longer to learn their two languages. Most bilingual children hear more of one of their languages than the other, and so their skills will be stronger in the language that they hear more of. Children learn language roughly in the proportion that they hear it. So if they hear 80% English, then about 80% of all the language that they know would be in English. And if they hear 50% English and 50% another language, then we expect their skills to be split roughly between the two languages. But the main point here is that m most children who hear more than one language hear a lot more of one than the other. And so their skills will be stronger in the language they hear more of. And as I started off saying, because bilingual children know less of, their, of each of their languages than monolingual children know, they just take a little bit longer to get to those language milestones in that language than monolingual children do. Um, and these children, as a result of hearing one language more than the other, usually have stronger skills in one language. So what this looks like is if it takes um, a monolingual child up to 18 months to learn to say 10 words, at 18 months we would not expect a bilingual child to say all 10 words in one language. But what we would expect is that bilingual children know as many words as monolingual children that divided across their two languages and depends, on again, on how much they hear of each language. So now we can see if you look at the 
uh, left side of this graph, and you focus right. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to grab my pointer. Um, well, if you look, if you look right here, <laughs> you can see that at 22 months. Monolingual children, which are the blue line, and bilingual children, which is the green dashed line, both say about 200 words on average. That's how many words they say. And of course, in early intervention, the children that we see usually say far fewer words than this. But if we just add the number of words that they say in one language and the number of words that they say in another language, then we have a way of determining whether bilingual children are um, are making good progress or not. So we just add the two, the words they say in both languages. And over time we can see that English really starts to dominate for, for children who do hear more than one language. And this is really especially true for children who we already know are going to start off language learning with some more specific and unique disabilities. So I was wondering um, if you could just type into the comment bar, which is at the bottom of um, the toolbar, underneath your names in the little white box, if you just type in a reason that you think that this might be true. Why do um, children that we know have disabilities like autism or hearing loss or Down syndrome, why would it be the case that they um, start to hear a lot more English than monolingual kids, I mean than children, bilingual kids without disabilities? Sorry. Anna says, interventions are in English, service providers speak English, correct. These are both things I hear a lot. Patty, hi. The therapists, yes, they speak English. English is everywhere, right? It's in the television. It's on all the apps. Uh, Cordy says they hear it out in the community. Hi, my friends in Arlington say that um, that there's more exposure probably to adults who mostly speak English, and that's certainly true outside of the home. Right. Um, and there are other reasons too. Um, yeah, Lisa, right? Parents focus on English to because they think they need to do that to get the kids ready for school. But one of the reasons that these kids here, I'm talking about kids who are hearing more than lang one language and already have some kind of diagnosis early in development, is that their their parents are all encouraged by uh, people with very good intentions, by people in their community, by family members, and by physicians. They're often given advice about language, and much of the advice they hear, especially if it's from English-speaking doctors, is to speak English with their children. So over time, what this results in is that children with known disabilities, like, uh, like hearing loss, for example, are going to hear their home, hear and use their home language less than other bilingual children who do not have a, a, a diagnosis early in development. And this results in their home language skills growing very slowly. And over time, these children become at risk of not sharing their parents' language. Um, and this creates some, some problems. For example, if bilingual children with a disability uh, do not share their parents' language, if the parents follow physician's advice, for example, to speak English with the children, yet everyone in the else in the household is speaking the other language in the home, whether it's Spanish or any other language, then this creates a kind of language island for the child with disabilities where that child is, um, does not get that rich input in the parent's first language or home language um, and is limited to English rather than being able to share in all of the household activities and routines with the family in their other language. So if I think about um, how English input for children, children hearing a lot more um, English in the environment plays out, it, it could look like this. So here we have little Sara, Sarita, and she speaks English and Spanish. And this would be very typical for a child being raised probably anywhere in the U.S. right now except for in very heavily Spanish-speaking communities. Um, her parents say that she understands everything in Spanish, but she uses it just in little routine phrases like come mommy and other water, water please that she has learned. Overall, she hears more English in Spanish, so she understands more English and uses more phrases in English 
And although she has good comprehension in both languages and can follow directions in Spanish and English, she develops strong expressive language skills only in one language, and that's English. So that's um, a pretty typical pattern that we see when parents switch to English in the home in particular. Sorry, um, there we go. Okay, so I talked about knowing whether a bilingual child um, is developing typically just by using that total vocabulary measure and adding up the number of words that they say in each of their two languages, and that's a really quick and easy way to um, to assess their overall language development to include knowledge of both languages. But the other way that kids that qualify for early intervention services, as we all know, is through a designation of atypical development. And so what would this look like? How would I know if a bilingual child is developing atypically in terms of um, determining eligibility? So here I have another little girl. We'll call her Caitlin. And uh, this is actually from a real scenario that came up on one of the discussion boards for the American Association of Speech-Language Pathologists, um, ASHA, just last week. So here's Caitlin. She's 18 months old. She hears Korean at home, and she hears English in the community. And her parents have downloaded some apps for her on their iPad. Those are in English. She says about three words in each language, including mama and dada. And this particular case would make eligibility determination difficult because at um, using the ELAP or the Early Learning Accomplishment Profile, which is um, the anchor tool that I most frequently use in Arlington, um, but it's also a milestone on many of these assessments. Around 18 months, um, we think that children should be saying several words, and some, some checklists say 10 words, and some others say just several words. And so here we have a child who says about six words altogether, including mama and dada. So she's sort of on that borderline, like she is starting to say some words, but are, is it enough? And so in this case, we would start looking at which words is she saying? Are these really functional words like more and up? Or are they words that she's learned from an app or a toy, words like a number or a color or a shape, like two or circle? Um, does she use gestures to communicate and to replace some of the words that she's not saying? And then we would look at all the other things that we look at for monolingual children too, like what does her play look like? Does she have typical play skills? Is she, how do her social relationships look? Is she um, interacting with her parents and peers in the ways that we expect? And let's, we would also want to look at, con at language comprehension. So does she understand some simple directions in one or both of those languages? Um, in this case of this little girl, if, this, if, we think of, if we think very specifically about what she's doing, and she says functional words like no, more, up, milk, or other words that reflect her interests and in activities like ball or dog or car, and she has appropriate social skills like using gestures and sharing interests with her caregivers and interacting appropriately with other children, then I would not find her eligible. And if this child had difficulty understanding what her caregivers were saying to her, or if she um, had unusual words in her vocabulary, words like colors, numbers, shapes, letters, um, instead of more functional words that reflect learning from her natural environment, um, or if she's having difficulty get her, getting her needs met using other ways of communicating, like gestures and especially pointing, then there would be, just like with a monolingual child, cause for concern, and I would find her eligible. So hopefully that gives you a good example of how we can use um, our knowledge of bilingual development to determine eligibility uh, for a child who is developing typically and also for a child who may have some signs of atypical development. So one of the big questions that I hear from my own students, but also from parents, from doctors, um, from other early intervention providers, and even from family members and friends is, but are there some children who just are not able to learn two languages? And so you could, uh, the response I want you to type into chat is, what kind of conditions do you think might make a child have such difficulty learning language um, that you 
that you're really not sure that you have a question of whether learning two languages is a good um, environment for them. And you can just type that into the chat bar. Lisa, thanks for getting us started. Ch sure, children with an autism diagnosis, this is one of the largest groups. Are there any other kinds of kids? Uh, Corey says maybe a child with a really significant language delay um, or hearing loss. Um, but but good plan Paladin come in and say if they can learn language, they can learn more than one. That's true. Harrisonburg, uh, Rockingham says low cognitive skills. That's another great group that I'm not going to talk specifically about today. Um, although I am going to talk about children with Down syndrome. And Arlington says um, any child can learn two languages. Arlington, um, I agree. Let's hear a little bit about the current research. So what I've done for the next um, part of my talk is, oh, Patty's making such a good point that I want to pause here and address this. Patty says, uh, the child who isn't learning two languages just may not be getting consistent exposure to both languages, so that's who would not be able to learn two languages, and that's absolutely right, and that's one of the highlight points that I'm going to be making over the next couple of slides. So um, I'm going to talk about children with a diagnosis of autism, um, hearing loss, and Down syndrome. And these are three areas of bilingual development that have come up in, in the research very recently in the past couple of years. There are some nice studies that look at uh, what's happening with all three of these special populations and whether they're able to learn two languages or what that looks like um, in the homes right now. So for the children with autism, this is a study of about 30 children up in Canada who heard English plus one of a few other languages at home. And the, um, the researchers found some really interesting things. And the first one was that parents of young children with an autism diagnosis started speaking English to their children. And these are parents whose native language is not English, but they started speaking English at a much younger age to these children than parents of children without a disability. So these children start hearing English earlier, and that means that over time, the cumulative amount of English that they hear is a lot more than their peers without a diagnosis. Um, and the reasons that parents gave for using English um, at home was because people like the daycare, um, the pediatrician, the um, the family and friends had all told them to switch to English to make it less complicated for the child to learn how to talk. Um, one of the common features of all kids with autism diagnoses, even the children who go on to be highly verbal, is that they start off with a language delay. And so in that moment of language delay, I think where, where professionals are seeing more atypical development, then people get worried and they say, well, maybe we should just focus on English. But one interesting finding was that not all of the parents followed this good advice to speak English. It's actually not good advice. But they didn't follow the advice of the doctors to speak English. And the parents who really kept their home languages um, in use with all members of the family, including directing the home language to the child, the, ch the children learned both languages. So when kids with autism don't learn uh, their home language and they only learn English, it's not, we don't believe that it's because uh, they're not able to learn their home language, but we believe that their, their parents have reduced the amount of the home language that they hear, making it um, not enough for them to learn from. And I think that was Patty's point on the last slide. So I'll just reiterate is that these kids hear English earlier and more English over time than kids without disabilities, and they have the capacity to learn two languages when parents use the home language at home. But because most parents do switch over to English at the advice of someone else, um, they hear so much more English that they really tend to become uh, English speech speakers and lose that connection um, with their family's home language. And many of the parents in the study reported that this is a problem in their home, um, that the child did become more disconnected in terms of language and that the parents had to use their English, which is their weaker language with these children, and it just made communication. They felt like it was um, an additional barrier to communication, um, and they wished that their child spoke their home language better. So that was kind of a, an interesting 
um, and very enlightening study on that topic. So the next group of kids that I'm going to talk about, again, really recent research from the last couple of years is children with a hearing loss. And this could be kids who have a hearing aid or kids who have a cochlear implant. So these babies now, thank goodness, uh, due to newborn hearing screenings are usually identified really um, very shortly, either at birth or, or right after birth. And, um, you know, we again might have the same kind of question like, gosh, these kids, we know that kids with hearing loss have a little bit more difficulty learning English, so should we be limiting their exposure to just one language? You can go ahead and use the poll at the top, that little, um, on the far right, the checkbox. You can either click uh, yes or no. Patty, I love your enthusiasm. Absolutely not. Um, all right, well, I'll get to the research in just a second. Let's give everybody a chance to weigh in if they want to. It looks like we have a, a pretty big consensus that everybody says no, and I'm sure you could tell from uh, the way I've structured the talk that I would also say no, that we don't need to limit their exposure um, to one language. So children with hearing loss, these are studies over uh, just the past two years that were published. And um, one, the first study that I'm going to talk about is for children who hear Spanish and English at home and are also identified with a hearing loss. Um, and to kind of get to the end of the story quickly, um, the take-home message from the study, this is by Clarence Bunta and colleagues out in Texas, and what they found was that um, children who heard Spanish, these are all kids with hearing loss using a hearing aid, when they heard Spanish and English at home, um, by around age seven, their English was exactly as good as monolingual children's um, English. So it didn't harm their English to hear Spanish at home. And the big benefit was that they stayed connected with their family's home language. And there are also um, some signs that by learning the family's home language, these children were learning early concepts and stimulating cognitive development in a way that had longer term benefits for the children. Um, and one way to think about that would be if you learn the concepts that go with numbers or colors in Spanish, then when you go to school, you're just learning the words that map onto those concepts. Um, and that, that should make the researchers um, think across several different studies that that should make overall learning easier for these kids. So um, supporting the home language, in this case of this study, Spanish, that that could support English language learning for children with hearing aids over a longer period um, and help them academically. There's a second study um, which looked at children who have cochlear implants and are born to deaf parents. This is a pretty common uh, scenario. So two deaf parents have a child who's also born deaf, and then they recently have many of these families have started opting to, um, to have their child receive a cochlear implant. And so when we looked at a different kind of bilingualism here, a child learning sign language as a, as a native language, the home language, and learning spoken uh, language through the cochlear implants, we see that the kids um, who are learning to sign and speak really did well on several measures of spoken English. So they were able to use the spoken English um, in a way, in a similar way to children who only heard English and had cochlear implants. But we also saw that their use of sign language at home um, benefited their spoken English. And it's probably in a way that's very similar to what I described for the children with hearing aids, is that you learn a concept in one language, in this case sign language, and then you just learn the English word, the spoken English word that goes with that same concept. So um, again, this is another special population that's able to benefit from having two languages. And in this case, I imagine it's particularly important to stay connected with that parent's home language and, um, and be able to have that, that close communication with the family. And this is a little bit of an aside, but we, there are lots of studies that show that sharing your parent's home language is really important. And one of the really important things that it does is help children talk about complicated issues 
uh, with their families that when they, the parents and children do not share um, a common language, uh, native language, then we find that those relationships um, are damaged in the sense that, that the children and the parents have a hard time, for example, in adolescents in particular, talking about difficult issues together. So the last group of children that we'll look at is children with Down syndrome. And um, I'm not going to provide a lot of details about these studies, but there is beautiful work by um, a researcher whose last name is Raining Bird. And she published a book in 2017 um, with several examples and studies that showed that children with Down syndrome could successful could be successful learners of two languages. Um, and not just that, but we probably, a lot of us have seen children with Down syndrome who go on to um, to really know and to have very strong language skills, I would say, and to be able to um, read and write. And even children who are learning two languages and have, have Down syndrome can also acquire these skills. So those are probably the biggest groups of children with um, with identified disabilities or other diagnoses early in development um, that we all have questions about. And now we can see that there's evidence from different studies that really show us that we don't have to worry about whether these kids can, can cope with hearing two languages. Um, and so just to summarize kind of the key findings across all three or more, there are more than three studies, but across all of these studies, is that um, we know that children who have a diagnosis end up having less access to their parents' home language. Um, they also have less access to services in their home language. This is something I think that Patty mentioned earlier uh, in our chat tool, but this is something that was mentioned in all of the articles that I, that I read on these topics. Um, so even in early intervention services, we come in and we're primarily English-speaking providers for most families. And um, the tendency is for the parents to try to interact with the provider. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. To interact with the provider in English. But I'm going to talk to you about some strategies today to see if we can help the parents, help their kids with the home language a lot more. Um, and the great news that I, I saw across all of these studies is that children with these um, early diagnoses can still be successful learners of two languages and that learning the two languages seems to have the same kinds of benefits um, that we expect for uh, dual language learning for kids without known disabilities. So how are we going to do this? What should we tell parents? And I think um, I find myself saying these two things a lot right now. And so um, I thought I would just put them out there uh, in case you want to say these two things too. It's if you, to the parents I would say, parents if you want your child to speak your home language and English, then he needs to hear your home language a lot. And by a lot, I might mean predominantly, if that's your stronger language, your home language, then let the child hear your home language predominantly at home. Um, and we also know, uh, I talked a little bit about this in the first part of the bilingual talks that I'm doing, that when children say words, they learn them better than when they just hear the words. So parents, if you want your child to speak and not just understand your home language, you need to ask your child to say the words in your language. So sometimes parents will say something in the home language and then the child will respond um, either in English or by nodding or shaking their head or pointing or some other way of avoiding the home language. But if we really want the best development of the home language and an ability for the child to communicate with the parents, not just respond, then the child also needs to say those words in the home language. OK. So now we're going to use our pointer tool. Um, the pointer tool is just to the right of the chat bar, the larger chat bar. All right, yes, that's right. And it's the starburst. So you can just use any of those pointer tools to um, drag over to um, the bubbles with the ages and say, when do you think bilingual children might catch up 
in the language skills. And you can just drop your pointer there. Which, there we go. Lots of it depends. And some maybe third grade or age five. And guess what? The real answer is it depends, but I would also say that all of those, um, the answers age five or third grade, or it depends, those are all true. And I'll explain how. Um, so when we think about language, it's, um, it depends on what part of language we're talking about when we ask if a child has caught up. So uh, think about little Sarita, the first little girl I showed, who could understand, understand English and Spanish but only spoke English. Um, so we might say in comprehension, she is caught up. She would catch up before age five. But in expression or how she says words, it might take her a really long time to catch up. Um, for pronunciation, there are several studies that say that's not a problem, that bilingual kids learn how to pronounce words as well as monolingual kids before age five. So that's good news. Um, that tends to relate more to early spelling and reading, so that's, that's great news. But expressive vocabulary, like the number of words that a kid says, that will not catch up even probably in the best bilingual kids, the, the most bilingual, the most balanced bilingual, which is only a small portion of bilingual kids, not by age five. And more complex aspects of language would even take longer. Um, so we really would expect for bilingual kids to have a little weaker language skills in English compared to children who only hear English through the early school years. and. Um, like maybe as long as third grade. There are a couple of studies that, that suggest that third grade is when kids who are raised with two languages um, start catching up. But that's not, that's only for kids who like hear two languages very early in development, not kids who um, start learning their other language um, after they enter school. Okay, so one way that we know that we can help parents um, in early intervention, uh, sorry, I'm going to say the wrong thing. This is a question for you. What should you do if you do not speak the parent's language? And you can just share your idea in chat. Just write me a word or two about what you think you might do. You're the provider. You go into the family's home. They speak a language that you do not speak. What will you do? I see um, Arlington says, oh, Arlington and Alexandria, interpreter in person, face to face, right? Um, and then in Gucci and Powhatan, they're saying uh, bring an interpreter, but you could use a telephone interpreter if you needed to. You can wing it. I'm going to talk about how. And one way is like Harrison Berg says, by by learning some simple phrases, maybe. That's hard even for me. Um, and I find like right now I have at least three families that I'm working with who speak a language that I just, I don't speak at all. And it's, I'm not really going to be able to learn those simple phrases to, to work with them in, in Russian. Um, so using an interpreter is um, probably the most common thing that people do. But what if you can't find an interpreter, what should you do? Um, well, I, let's go back and talk about the interpreter. So ideally, the interpreter would be um, someone who's able to come regularly so that they can get used to what services look like. Um, if you can't find an interpreter because it's a, a more rare language in your community, then you can see if the parents have another adult from the community. And I've been successful in finding um, adults like family members, uh, um, adult sister, cousin, um, a community member perhaps from um, a migrant workers association. I've been successful finding someone there uh, or someone from the family's religious organization. I've also found people willing to help from those kinds of um, organizations. 
and I see Corey and Patty are saying no children. Right, we're not talking about finding a child in the community. Usually there are other adults in the community who are really interested in helping families if they know that the child is having some difficulties. And like I said, there's, there are almost always community organizations um, that could help you find um, an available adult. And so like I said, that would be someone from um, maybe uh, a religious group, a community group, um, a, a family member, neighbor, someone who lives in the in the same building, um, but not certainly not a child, and certainly not an older sibling that you're um, asking to uh, interpret for the parents. That's not appropriate, and that child just um, uh, won't be able to won't be able to be responsible in that way. And that's we're talking about something different from involving the families, other children in sessions. We're talking about making the child responsible for the conversation between the provider and the family. Okay, so um, oh, Dina says, how should you address confidentiality with a community member? That's a great question and um, I have not done that myself in a while, but I know that there are procedures for this, so um, probably I, one of the um, agency directors could probably step in and answer more specifically, but I'm guessing that it would be like having that um, interpreter uh, or community member sign a document. Um, you can't, but you can talk to them. Oh, just kidding. That's so mean. Yeah, there are ways. Yeah, I think somebody probably has a confidentiality statement out there. All right, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I have done this in, in another community, so I'm sure it can be done. And um, this is one of the things that's most widely recommended is that you find a community member to, to help out. Um, and of course, the family is giving consent, right? The family is consenting to have that person there. They're working with you to help find the volunteer. Um, you're not. It's not typically a volunteer that you find on the street and bring in. It's someone that they've gone to their church or religious organization or they've gone to a migrant workers organization uh, for people who've provided other advice for them helping to identify someone. Okay, so moving on. Um, what do we do about adapting strategies to, um, to other languages? So um, I know my, I'm a speech language pathologist. I know my strategies in English. Um, but then I need to be able to work with a family who speaks Chinese or Russian or Spanish and help them use these strategies. So the strategies are not language specific and the child's communication needs are the same. But one thing um, that may surprise you if you start working with a lot of families who speak a different language at home is that although the communication needs are the same, the words may be different. And let's look at um, how this might, might work. So if I have a strategy, and um, the strategy is model what you want the child to say. So here's a little girl requesting please. So if I'm just working with this family, and this little girl's reaching for her mother's cell phone or something else that she wants, I don't know, my pen during a session, um, I'm gonna say, say please, please, and I'm gonna model what I want this child to say. Um, and recently when I was working with a Russian family, a Russian speaking family, I said, oh, well, what, how would you say please? And they said a very long word. And I said, oh, well, how could we get the child to say that in Russian? And they said, well, that she's not gonna say please, that's too hard. Um, and we ended up brainstorming together that they actually would use a different word in Russian in that kind of situation. And it would be a really short word that's a child-friendly word. The word would be die, for example, um, which means give me or give. And so um, sometimes if you just ask the family to say the same word of how do you say please in Russian, they can answer that question, but it doesn't mean that that's the word that should, they should be using to, model, to um, implement that strategy. So I hope that makes sense. I'll give you another example. Um, if I am prompting a child to say a word like, say yes, so not just modeling, but now I'm actually asking the child to say the word, say yes. 
um, recently working with a Chinese family, I said, oh, like, can you tell her to say, tell her to say yes right now? And they kind of looked at each other and said, like, oh, this would be, um, this would be hard because in Chinese you have to say yes plus kind of the sentence about what yes is about. Like, do you want this? It would be yes, I want or something like that, an equivalent like that. Um, but again, um, by brainstorming with the family, I realized that they don't really need to tell their child to say the literal translation of yes. They want their child to make an affirmative response, and they can do that by saying in Chinese, you, you often say something like okay for a positive response. So um, it's how. And uh, so we, we figured out really quickly that instead of asking her to say yes, they should be asking her to say okay to answer a question. Um, sometimes I use the strategy of uh, focusing on a particular sound, um, and I do this when um, a child is really slow to add new words, but maybe I've noticed that the words that the child says all start with a B, so the child is saying something like, uh, like ball um, in English, but this Chinese-speaking family really wanted her to say other words that start with a B, um, and they wanted her to say words in Chinese. So first um, we looked for words um, in her environment that she might be interested in, and I saw a baby doll, and said, oh, we could, we could have her say baby, uh, and how do you say baby in Chinese, and it just so happened it's bao bao, so that was a great one. So by starting with um, brainstorming B words, we could find a few words um, that start with that sound in Chinese that are also really relevant for the child in, in her environment. Um, I'm trying to think if there's something else about this particular strategy. No, I think that's it. So sometimes if a child is really stuck and limited in how many sounds they say, and we can just keep adding words that start with the same sound, that's a good strategy. And in this case, having the parents help pick those words um, from their home language would be a great a great way to proceed. So here's another strategy. Um, these are for usually for older kids who now have started to build a vocabulary. Um, label the child's actions. So the child uh, grabs a broom and starts sweeping, and you're saying sweep, sweep, sweep. And recently, when I was working with um, a Chinese-speaking family, um, the child fell down and his hands got dirty, and he was brushing his hands off and looking at me. And so I was saying brush, 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 clean your hands, brush, brush, brush. And so, again, we brainstormed together with the mother, and she said um, that you wouldn't say, like, clean or brush in that case, but you would say, oh, you would not say brush, brush, or wipe your hands off or something like that, or even dirty, you wouldn't say. But she did think that you could say for a child, pai pai, which means, like, clean, clean. And in Chinese, it's common to use two repetitions of a word. So she could say, like, pai pai, pai pai as a child-friendly way to, t to model brushing your hands off um, the words that map onto that action. So again, I think all of these strategies um, make us recall, remember that uh, just because we say um, a word in English, there might not be an equivalent word in the other language, but there is going to be an equivalent concept. Um, it might not be the same word, but it will be an equivalent word, and we, we just have to work with the family to find those words in their language. Okay, and a final strategy um, is to um, increase the amount that parents speak with their children, just providing a more language-rich environment in the home. And um, when we have a language other than, uh, for Spanish, for example, we can find a lot of Spanish books and materials at most libraries, um, but you might find in working with families of other cultures and other language groups that um, there are not materials available uh, in the community and even in the family's home, and so you would want to substitute um, very culturally appropriate activities for that family, and those could be things like looking at photos together. I've had a family where the parents um, like to tell stories about family life by looking through photo albums together with their very young children. That was a family from South America. Um, another family um, 
didn't really have children's books um, or other materials like that, toys, but they did have learning flashcards. And this is a really common way that um, some parents from Asia and probably other places too, but in my experience, many Asian parents, um, I've seen Korean, Vietnamese, and Chinese families using flashcards to interact with their child to get them to say, to name pictures on flashcards as a way of, um, as a way of playing, really and playing with other educational materials rather than um, playing games with the child or playing with toys. So just focusing on what the family's comfort level is about how they um, increase the amount of language input in the home. That it might not be um, the way that you, uh, that you would recommend for parents who have a huge bookshelf of English uh, children's books. Okay, so the final question that we're going to address today before I go back to you all is um, what do you think? Do children need more English as they start to get ready for school? Um, and you can go up to the check mark under your name, the poll, and just click yes or no. Do children need more English as they get ready for school? I say there's a, there's a big sidebar conversation here with Dana and Patty and how things have gone wrong sometimes with interpreters. All right, so yeah, before you go get a community member to interpret, I think I'm just going to sum up. Um, check it out with your local directors and administrators to make sure that you get the procedures right. So do children need more English as they get ready to school? The question is yes or no. Um, and you can use your polling tool. It seems like so far we have kind of a split. Um, children who go, I'll give you the answer to this question. So children who start school with more English do tend to do better over time. Um, but we also know that it could be difficult for families to have um, more English in the home, like if both parents speak the home language and don't really speak English very well. In that case, children can start learning English more in the community by attending library programs or other community um, children's activity programs to get some early exposure to English, um, but still keep the home language in the school possibly. And otherwise, there are lots of children who start school, um, start school only really speaking the home language, and they do seem to um, learn plenty of English right away. That's not true for every child, but in general. Um, as children get ready for school, it's important, more important for them to have the concepts than to have English per se. So if families are concerned about that, one thing that we can tell them is that if the child's learning concepts like colors and shapes and numbers as they get ready to start school and they're doing that in their home language, that they'll be ready for school. Okay, so here's a moment to pause and kind of reflect on what you've heard today that you, um, that's something that you might have learned. And if you could just type something in the toolbar, that would, uh, in the chat bar, that would be great. Let's hear back from you all. What have you learned? Oops, I keep putting my pointer over there. I see some people are typing. Concepts are more important than words. Um, Janine says she likes some alternatives to books. Yeah, I think this is really important, just kind of looking around and following the family's lead on how they want to talk more. Um, and Corey says it's a complicated topic, but all children can learn two languages. And this is really, again, following the parent's lead. So if the parents want to use their native language or if they feel that it's important, let them know it's okay, just like Lisa is saying right here. And also let them know that it's not going to be sufficient for them to speak their native language to their children just a little bit. You really, the children need to hear a lot of language to learn that home language. English is going to kind of take over. Yes, Arlington, I don't know why the medical field does not know this information yet. Um, 
that kids really can, that all children can learn two languages. Um, and and I see uh, probably most bilingual families that I work with, um, even right now, even in Arlington, the pediatricians have told them, almost all of them, to just speak one language, pick one. And that's a shame because that really can be something that um, separates children from their families over time if they don't share that home language. Across the border in um, Alexandria, you, yeah, you would think that in Northern Virginia where we have um, a large a large group of families who don't speak English at home and um, these kids are in, in the schools um, that we would be giving better information to the families, but we're not really. All right, we have a few minutes left and I would be happy to take any questions from you. If you have a question, I'll do my best to answer it, so type away. Any questions? How much of this content is being delivered to students in speech language pathology? Um, you might guess at GW quite a bit because I'm teaching them. Um, at other universities, I really don't know. I can tell you. Um, that interacting uh, with young SLPs from other schools, I often hear that it's an area that they don't hear enough of, enough about, and um, they really are not quite sure um, what they should be doing with families. And I even hear some SLPs um, with good intentions saying things like uh, they think that bilingualism is confusing, and it's really interesting because. Most of the people who think who are saying that bilingualism is confusing don't speak two languages. Um, yeah, it's really important for for everyone to hear this information. I mean, we've published it widely, and even in pediatric journals. And um, um, I'm trying to do my best to do professional development, uh, but it's probably going to take a while until this information becomes more mainstream. And like I said, some of these papers on the special populations are really only, um, have only been published in 2017 and 18. So think about that. Arlington says, okay, what's your recommendation when one parent speaks English and one speaks only Spanish? And I, I saw this just this weekend, an uh, adorable young couple, the mom speaks Persian and the dad speaks Spanish and English is their common language. So you get parents who speak different languages, what are you going to do? And um, let's pick Arlington's example of one English and one Spanish speaker in the home and uh, what can you do? And in that case I would just tell each parent to speak their better language to the child. If one parent um, is homeless and interacts with the child less, then the child will hear the other language more and will develop skills that are stronger in the language that he hears more of. But parents like this often make a decision that they really that it's important for the kids to speak Spanish, and um, most kids who hear two languages at home do hear one language from someone who does not speak it as a native language. So the parents could make a decision, for example, only to speak Spanish at home, with the hopes that the child will uh, will understand and speak Spanish. I hope that answered your question. Dana asks, are there good resources for families about this topic? There are a couple of books out there um, for parents. Uh, I don't have them off the top of my head. But um, I think that this information for parents is kind of slow in coming out too, just like I'm saying it's pretty recent research. Like our, my own papers on this topic were just published in 2012 and 13. So that sounds like a long time ago, but if I were trying to get a book published in that time frame, that wouldn't be that long. Um, resources for interpreters. I do not know of any resources for interpreters. That sounds like a great need area for someone to jump into. Um, Janine asks if there are ways to maxi maximize the usefulness of phone interpreters when face-to-face -face is not an option. And that's not something that I've done much of, Janine, and so off the top of my head, 
Um, I'm going to have a hard time answering it. If anybody else has an answer, maybe we can jump in. But um, I would say just trying to um, brainstorm, continue to brainstorm ways to say things in the family's language to implement the strategy, explain, have the interpreter explain the strategy, and then have the interpreter help you have the conversation with the parent about how to use um, their home language to carry out the strategy. Okay, Lisa says, sometimes there are some generational things going on in homes. So the grandmother wants to speak the native language and the parents want to speak English. And it's because the parents think the child will be delayed if they let the grandmother speak the other language. So Lisa, yes, I've seen this. And mostly this is people worrying about school readiness issues, um, is what I've heard, uh, or not wanting the child to seem like, um, seem different from other families who speak English at home. Um, I think just developing an awareness uh, with families, understanding that they can um, have their child learn more than one language and that there are tremendous benefits to learning more than one language. So some of the benefits people might have seen in the news would be things like being having better cognitive skills or attention or focus. And those are true, but it's only by a small margin. And the real big benefit is just being able to talk about complicated things with all the family members and being able to navigate through life with our language skills. And grandmother certainly seems like a good person to help do that. Um, Patty says there are probably challenges in other parts of the state and country where there's not such easy access to interpreters. Yes, and we see that even in Arlington. Um, even in Arlington, we see this where we have more rare languages. So there are interpreters available for some very commonly spoken languages and then um, not much for some other languages. And Anna says in Prince William County, um, they rarely have interpreters. And Patty says it's a challenge to, um, to use phone interpreters. And so what do other people do? Let's see if other people have some recommendations before we wrap up here. Oh, Glenn, this is a great, um, this is a really interesting observation. So Glenn says, when I was a pre-K teacher, I noticed that many commercial music recordings that were played at circle time were too fast, and we needed to slow those down to make the to make them slower. Was that for English, like for the English speaking kids, Glenn? Oops, Arlington, you said you hate something, but I don't know what you hate. Yeah, so for learning English, for any language learners, um, yeah, we hate phone interpretation. I, I don't think I've had to do it, um, but I can imagine. I've done it for an ASP, and it was painful. Um, yeah, for all children, uh, children benefit from slowed input. Um, so slowing those recordings down sounds good, too. OK, I can hear the uh, clock bells outside my window here at the university. and. So that tells me it's time for me to wrap up. Um, if I haven't answered your questions today, then please feel free to send me an email. I love to hear from people. Um, and I'm happy to continue the conversation or um, you know, start a new conversation about these interesting topics. I, I always learn from, uh, from people who are out in the field in the trenches and what their needs are. And if you have something that you'd like to know more about, just reach out, send me a little email, and I'll be happy to talk to you. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It was um, really fun. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I think that was a very helpful topic. And for all of us that don't know, this takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation for this. So thank you so much for your time for doing this for us. We appreciate it. And everyone will receive a survey through email. Um, so once you complete that survey, that's when you'll get your completion of certificate um, at that time. And it looks like Corey said, just a reminder that we will be taking a break from Talks on Tuesday for the summer. So thank you again, everyone, and thank you, Cynthia and Jeannie. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeannie and Lisa, for all your help in putting this together. I couldn't have done it without you.
No, we are just lucky you did this for us. So thank you for your time. <laughs> fun. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Thanks, Sylvia. Bye-bye. Okay.